<laughs> you're such a big dreamer. I am Vuyo and I believe everyone is a dreamer. And as big, big dreamers, we never lose, we either win or learn. Without wasting any time, let's start learning. Chapter 3 of The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel is titled Never Enough. John Bogle, the founder of Vanguard who passed away in 2019, once shared an insightful story about money that we often overlook. He recounted an encounter at a billionaire's party on Shelter Island where Kurt Vonnegut told Joseph Heller that the host, a hedge fund manager, had earned more money in a single day than Heller had from his immensely popular novel Catch-22 throughout its entire history. Heller's response was profound. Yes, but I have something he will never have. Enough. The word enough struck Bogle with its simplicity and eloquence, leaving him astonished for two compelling reasons. First, he realized the abundance in his own life, and second, Heller's statement rang true. In our society, even among the wealthiest and most influential individuals, there appears to be no limit on what they consider enough. Bogle found this concept to be astute and influential. He went on to provide two examples that illustrate the perils of not recognizing enough and what valuable lessons we can glean from them. Rajat Gupta Rajat Gupta's life began in Kolkata, where he faced early hardships, losing his parents as a teenager. While some people are said to start life on third base, Gupta's circumstances were even more challenging. He couldn't even see the baseball stadium. However, Gupta's subsequent achievements were nothing short of extraordinary. By his mid-40s, he had risen to become the CEO of McKinsey, the world's most prestigious consulting firm. In 2007, he retired from this position to take on roles with the United Nations and the World Economic Forum, partnering on philanthropic endeavors with Bill Gates and serving on the boards of five public companies. From the slums of Kolkata, Gupta had transformed into one of the most successful businessmen alive. With his success came immense wealth, and by 2008, Gupta's reported net worth was a staggering $100 million. To most, this amount of money is beyond imagination, generating substantial income even with a modest annual return. Gupta could have pursued any path in life, but his aspiration, it seemed, was not merely to be a centimillionaire. Rajat Gupta's strong desire was to join the Billionaires Club, a circle populated by some of the wealthiest individuals globally. He was in a prime position to achieve this, as he served on the board of directors of Goldman Sachs, a bank surrounded by the world's richest investors. It was evident that he aimed for the billionaire circle, whereas Goldman Sachs was more in the hundreds of millions circle. In 2008, during the financial crisis when Goldman Sachs faced dire straits, Warren Buffett planned to invest $5 billion in the bank to bolster its survival. As a member of the Goldman board, Gupta had inside knowledge of this significant transaction before the public became aware. This information was immensely valuable, as the bank's survival hung in the balance, and Buffett's involvement would undoubtedly drive up the stock price. Within 16 seconds of learning about the impending deal, Gupta, who was participating in the Goldman board meeting, disconnected the call and reached out to a hedge fund manager named Raj Rajaratnam. While the content of their conversation wasn't recorded, Rajaratnam swiftly purchased 175,000 shares of Goldman Sachs, indicating the nature of their discussion. Hours later, the Buffett-Goldman deal was made public, causing Goldman's stock to surge, and Roger Atnam made a rapid $1 million. This example was just one instance of a supposed pattern. The SEC alleged that Gupta's insider tips had led to $17 million in profits for those he shared the information with. It appeared to be easy money, and from the perspective of prosecutors, it was an open and shut case. Both Gupta and Roger Atnam ended up in prison for insider trading, their careers and reputations forever tarnished. Bernie Madoff Now, let's turn our attention to Bernie Madoff. His criminal activities are well documented, and he stands as one of the most infamous Ponzi schemers since Charles Ponzi himself. Madoff orchestrated a fraudulent scheme that spanned two decades before his wrongdoing was exposed, ironically just a few weeks after Rajat Gupta's endeavors. What often goes unnoticed is that Madoff, much like Gupta, had a life beyond his fraudulent activities. Prior to the Ponzi scheme that would make him infamous, he enjoyed a thriving and entirely legitimate career as a businessman. Madoff operated as a market maker, a profession centered on connecting buyers and sellers of stocks, and he excelled in this role. In 1992, the Wall Street Journal provided a description of Madoff's market-making firm, illustrating its success. He has built a highly profitable securities firm, Bernard L. Madoff Investment Securities, which siphons a huge volume of stock trades away from the big board. 
The $740 million average daily volume of trades executed electronically by the Madoff firm off the exchange equals 9% of the New York exchanges. Mr. Madoff's firm can execute trades so quickly and inexpensively that it actually pays other brokerage firms a penny a share to execute their customers' orders, profiting from the spread between bid and ask prices that most stocks trade for. It's important to note that this wasn't a journalist mistakenly portraying a fraud that was yet to be uncovered. Madoff's market-making business was entirely legitimate. A former employee even attested that the market-making division of Madoff's business was making substantial profits, ranging from $25 million to $50 million annually. Bernie Madoff's legitimate, non-fraudulent business was undeniably a tremendous success by any measure, leading to his considerable, lawful wealth. However, this remarkable legitimate career was overshadowed by the subsequent revelation of his fraudulent activities. But why though? We must inquire about both Gupta and Madoff. Why would individuals already possessing hundreds of millions of dollars be driven by such a desperate thirst for more wealth that they were willing to jeopardize everything in its pursuit? Crimes committed by those on the brink of financial survival are one matter. As an example, a Nigerian scam artist once shared with the New York Times that he felt remorse for causing harm, but poverty will not make you feel the pain. However, the actions of Gupta and Madoff represent a different category. They were already in possession of everything. An unimaginable level of wealth, high social standing, substantial influence, and the freedom to enjoy it all. Yet, they threw it all away because their desire for more knew no bounds. Their concept of enough was absent. While they serve as extreme examples, there are non-criminal instances of such behavior as well. A hedge fund long-term capital management, for instance, employed traders with personal wealth extending into the tens and hundreds of millions of dollars, most of which was invested in their own funds. In their pursuit of additional gains, they assumed such significant risks that they ended up losing everything. This occurred in 1998, during the midst of one of the most remarkable bull markets and the strongest economy in history. Warren Buffett aptly summarized it. To make money they didn't have and didn't need. They risked what they did have and did need. And that's foolish. It is just plain foolish. If you risk something that is important to you for something that is unimportant to you, it just does not make any sense. There is no reason to risk what you have and need for what you don't have and don't need. This is one of those notions that is as evident as it is frequently disregarded. While most of us may never amass $100 million as Gupta or Madoff did, a notable proportion of those reading this book will, at some point in their lives, earn an income or accumulate a sum of money that can comfortably cover all reasonable needs and a substantial portion of their desires. If you're one of them, remember a few things. Few things to remember. 1. The hardest financial skill is getting the goalpost to stop moving. But it's one of the most important. If expectations rise with results there is no logic in striving for more because you'll feel the same after putting in extra effort. It gets dangerous when the taste of having more more money, more power, more prestige increases ambition faster than satisfaction. In that case one step forward pushes the goalpost two steps ahead. You feel as if you're falling behind. And the only way to catch up is to take greater and greater amounts of risk. Modern capitalism is a pro at two things. Generating wealth and generating. Envy. Perhaps they go hand in hand. Wanting to surpass your peers can be the fuel of hard work. But life isn't any fun without a sense of enough. Happiness, as it said, is just results minus expectations. 2. Social comparison is the problem here. Consider a rookie baseball player who earns $500,000 a year. He is, by any definition, rich. But say he plays on the same team as Mike Trout, who has a 12-year, $430 million contract. By comparison, the rookie is broke. But then think about Mike Trout. $36 million per year is an insane amount of money. But to make it on the list of the top 10 highest paid hedge fund managers in 2018 you needed to earn at least $340 million in one year. 14 that's, that's who people like Trout might compare their incomes to. And the hedge fund manager who makes $340 million per year compares himself to the top 5 hedge fund managers, who earned at least $770 million in 2018. Those top managers can look ahead to people like Warren Buffett, whose personal fortune increased by $3.5 billion in 2018. And someone like Buffett could look ahead to Jeff Bezos, whose net worth increased by $24 billion in 2018 a sum that equates to more per hour than the rich baseball player made in a full year. The point is that the ceiling of social comparison is so high that virtually no one will ever hit it. 
which means it's a battle that can never be won. Or that the only way to win is to not fight to begin with to accept that you might have enough, even if it's less than those around you. A friend of mine makes an annual pilgrimage to Las Vegas. One year he asked a dealer, What games do you play, and what casinos do you play in? The dealer, Stone Cold Serious, replied, Open quotes. The only way to win in a Las Vegas casino is to exit as soon as you enter. Close quotes. That's exactly how the game of trying to keep up with other people's wealth works, too. 3. Enough is not too little. The idea of having enough might look like conservatism, leaving opportunity and potential on the table. I don't think that's right. Enough is realizing that the opposite an insatiable appetite for more will push you to the point of regret. The only way to know how much food you can eat is to eat until you're sick. Few try this because vomiting hurts more than any meal is good. For some reason the same logic doesn't translate to business and investing, and many will only stop reaching for more when they break and are forced to. This can be as innocent as burning out at work or a risky investment allocation you can't maintain. On the other end there's Rajat Gupta's and Bernie Madoff's in the world, who resort to stealing because every dollar is worth reaching for regardless of consequence. Whatever it is, the inability to deny a potential dollar will eventually catch up to you. 4. After he was released from prison Rajat Gupta told the New York Times he had learned a lesson. Don't get too attached to anything your reputation, your accomplishments, or any of it. I think about it now, what does it matter? Okay, this thing unjustly destroyed my reputation. That's only troubling if I am so attached to my reputation. This seems like the worst possible takeaway from his experience, and what I imagine is the comforting self-justifications of a man who desperately wants his reputation back but knows it's gone. Reputation is invaluable. Freedom and independence are invaluable. Family and friends are invaluable. Being loved by those who you want to love you is invaluable. Happiness is invaluable. And your best shot at keeping these things is knowing when it's time to stop taking risks that might harm them. Knowing when you have enough. The good news is that the most powerful tool for building enough is remarkably simple and doesn't require taking risks that could damage any of these things. That's the next chapter. Please do not forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe for more content like this. And remember, a chapter a day keeps the mind enriched.